Hi guys, welcome to another session of our stack in Kampala base camp. And overall aim with the base camp is to onboard many developers into the Web3 space, specifically into the stack data ecosystem. So in our previous session, we're looking at Cairo. And as well in this session, we are continuing to dive into Cairo. We are where we're going to cover things like ownership, references and snapshots using structs. So it's going to be a fully practical session. And yeah, we have our sessions every Monday, 8 p.m. East Africa time. Wednesday, 8 p.m. East Africa time. And Friday, 8 p.m. East Africa time. And feel free to follow us on the central code. So, what is ownership? Cairo is the language built around a linear type system that allows us to statically ensure that in every Cairo program, a value is used exactly once. This linear type system helps prevent runtime errors by ensuring that operations that could cause such errors, such as writing twice the memory cell, are detected and compiled. As I said, yeah, so Cairo's principle is that it has an immutable memory cell. You write once to the memory cell. So this is achieved by implementing an ownership system and forbidding co copying and dropping values by default. So we are extensively going to cover the ownership system of Cairo. So ownership using a linear type system, in the linear, it, you can simply understand it as probably we can recall a number line system. You have one, two, three. It's something which is chronological. One, two, three. So it's, that's what you can try to picture that as a linear, something linear. So can you use a linear type system? In such a type system, any value, basic type, extract, must be used and must only be used once. So the either is the value is either destroyed or draw or moved. So destruction can happen when a variable goes out of scope, just like in Rust programming language. When a variable goes out of scope, destruction takes place when it when it structure is destruct destructured and then also using the destruct function itself so moving a value simply means passing that value to another function yeah so in case i have a function so i can pass a variable from one function to another function so this results in somewhat similar constraints the rest ownership model yeah, as I said in our previous session, that Rust it was inspired. Ah, sorry, Cairo was inspired by Rust. Yeah, but there are some differences. In particular, the Rust ownership model exists to avoid data races and concurrent mutable access to a memory value. If you had to cover extensively Rust, you realize that there is that concurrency. So in Cairo, this is obviously impossible since the memory is immutable, since you write to it once. Instead, Cairo leverages its linear type system for two main purposes. Ensuring that all code is provable and thus ver verifiable, as Cairo has a very good verification system. And that's why it's, it's good for solving those cryptographic puzzles as a layer two. And as I said, Cairo is being used by StackNet. When you're writing our smart contracts, we use Cairo to write our logic. So, another purpose is abstracting away the immutable memory of the Cairo virtual machine. So in Cairo, Ownership applies to variables and not to values. 
a value can safely be referred to by many different variables, even if they are mutable variables. As the value itself is immutable, so we can understand ownership as this. Each variable in Cairo has an owner, and then there can be one owner at a time. So for example, if I tell have declared a variable, and there cannot be two variables unless I've moved that variable to another variable. So when the owner goes out of scope, the variable is destroyed. So let's let's have some practical bit of it to understand ownership. So let's have a practical bit. So let's let's create a new project. And I say to create a project, you simply so we are going to move to our directory. So you use cab new and then can give it your, your preferable name so let me call this my ownership what is the Cairo default testing so after creating it I'm going to open it in Visual Studio Code and I open it I'm using Linux, I can open it in Visual Studio Code using code. Just like that. So it has to open up. So it has opened up. And as I said, it comes with a default file, which is the lib.cairo. Git ignore file. Of course, we have covered this in our previous sessions. So, let's have our practical bit of it. So, let's try to look at ownership in detail. So let's create a new file and let's call it my ownership. Ownership with Cairo. So let's, so in case I have as the main function in the driver. In, in case I have an array which is mutable, we looked at arrays in our previous session, and it's, it takes uh, the elements are supposed to have a data type of 128 bits and the unsigned integers, but initially my array is empty. Let me have as well another function here, which takes in a mutable array. So we talked about in array that you append to the end and then using the append function 
and then you remove elements from the front. Yeah. So here we are using the pop front function, and then we are using the so we are declaring we are calling our our full method trace. So So we look at here that we are removing, we are we are adding to our array. Yeah. So how we add to our, the array, we so moving the value simply means passing that value to another function. That's what entirely it means. And when that happens, the variable referring to that value in the witness scope is destroyed. So if I don't have moved my variable from function a to function b that means function a no longer has ownership of that variable i've moved it to function b yeah so that means that in the original scope in regards to function a we can no longer use, use it as it's it's it has got a new owner which is function b yeah so arrays are an example of a complex type that is moved when passing it to another function. Yeah. So initially, uh, let me first move let me first move values to this array. Let me as well move here three. Let me as well here move one. Yeah. Now if I'm to print the array right here. If I'm to print the first value of the array. I don't need to print it because when I append it means that ah uh, I've appended one every time I use the append method I'm writing a value so in this case my array was empty so every time it means my array has nothing in it so I've appended it with values one and three yeah so in order to see ownership in practice, so the, the reason is telling us that how does the type system ensure that the Cairo program never tries to write the same memory? So twice. So let's have a case scenario where we're trying to remove now the front of the array twice. Yeah. And so we are pending, we are adding, yeah. But the immutability comes in if we are removing yeah that's when that's when we perfectly see the 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 whole principle of Cairo of an immutable memory layer that means we cannot remove from it twice so let's use our the function we created and let's try to call it twice as, as I said initially our array is empty, it has nothing. And I'm I'm intending to remove from it twice. So by all means you have to get an error. Because our array is empty and we are trying to remove twice from the empty array. So when I try to run, as I said, we run by saying scab. Let's 
Scab Kyle Run. But first, before we run, but first, before we run, we have to, to, because every, every file is a module, and as I said, the lib.kyro file is the main driver in our project, so we have to import the module. It's just like in Python, now you say import OS. So in this case, also, we have to, to, to call that module, in this case, ownership.kyro, and we call it by its name. So we called so we called it ownership. So that's how we, we are calling it. Yeah? And as you see, it has already warned us. The compiler has already, the, the VS Code IntelliSense has already warned us that there is an error because we are, so you can just place your cursor right on the red highlight, highlighted and then it will tell you, in case you want to know how to debug, it will indicate the error. So there it's saying variable was previously moved. Trait has no implication in, in context. Yeah? So it's telling us the variable. It's telling us the variable has was previously moved. So we no longer we are we are we are we are accessing we are accessing something which was already moved. Yeah. So let's intend let's try to run and see the errors that we get. So as I said, you run by saying scab Cairo run. And it's compiling our code. So it's giving us the same error. Variable has previously moved. Variable has previously used there. Even it lets you know on line 10. So then you can trace that. We are trying to move the variable. We are trying to use a variable which has already moved. So it's no longer available in our scope. Yeah, so that's the error we are having. And that clearly shows ownership. So the copy trait, if a type implements the copy trait, so there is a trait which we can use to copy Passing a value of that of that type of function does not move the value. Instead, a new variable is created referring to the same value. So it's an it's a completely free operation because variables are chiral abstraction. So it kind of differs from the rest version of the copy trait, where the value value is potential potentially copied in memory. So in Rust, it's, the value itself is copied in the memory, but here it's, we use abstraction, Cairo abstraction, the concept of, of abstraction. And as I say, values in Cairo are always immutable. So in Rust, it's not the case. So while arrays and dictionaries can, can't be copied, custom types that don't contain any of them can be yeah so every time you want to every time you want to to copy to use that where, where i want to abstract our values yeah we use a copy trait yeah and all you have to do is to import it yeah by using derive so let's repeat our previous Example by implementing the copy trace. So here all we need to do is first so derive 
copy so that's how you use the copy and then the drop means that uh it's a trait used to drop to drop a value when it's out of scope yeah so here let's have a struct and let's call it point or we can call it Yeah, let's call it point. And it has it has field elements. It has x, which is a an unsigned 1.8 bits integer. And it has a, it has another field element y, another element y, which is as well of the same data type as x. Yeah. So I, I didn't think we need this. Let's restore our function. We have our function right there. So let's maintain our struct. And we call it point, which has elements x. And it has well has elements y. Yeah. So here let's make it take in take in a struct. Yeah. So it can take in a struct. So it can take in a struct, we can call it P, P1, and it takes on the data type of a struct, yeah? So you can decide to make your function do anything you want, yeah? So... So let's have here let's have here P2, yeah. Let's have here P2 is equal to points. We are making an instance of the struct. So let's Say P2 has X as 5 and then Y as 10. Yeah. So now let's come and call my function my foo. Yeah. And let's give it P2. Yeah. And then I'll really scroll it here. P2 as well. So we have our function, my foot. It's, it's, so we have an error. And as I said, To know what error you are having, you just place the cursor right over the highlights. I think it will give you more details on how to debug it. So you see, it's telling us variable not dropped. So it has no impl implementation in context. Yeah. And then here as well, here saying variable not dropped. <coughs> Yeah. So here, I'm following my documentation. 
So, we are supposed to attach, the error we are having is because we are supposed to attach, we are supposed to attach the, the traits to the struct, yeah? So, it's the right, the copy and yeah so we have attached the traits and now you can see after attaching the trace the copy and drop traits to the struct itself not to the function now we have no higher we don't have no error yeah so that's you are supposed to attach the the copy traits and drop traits to the struct itself and now our program can run properly yeah so in case we have to run our program we shall not get an error yeah so let's attempt to run it so in case we are to run it you'll find that we get no error and as I said, you run by saying scab Cairo run. So let's wait for an end. Uh, Tell us our program runs complete, run completed successfully without any error. Yeah. So that's so that's how we we play about with abstraction in Cairo. Yeah, we, there are those traits which are available for us. Uh, we have the copy traits and then we have the drop traits. So let's proceed. So as just an explanation to that. So we can pass we can pass in twice to the to the mindful function because the point type implements the copy trait. So let me get us our code here. Yeah. So he's saying we can pass, in this case, we can pass P2 twice to the mindful function because the point type, the point struct type, which is point which is a struct, implements the copy trait. This means that when we pass to 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 my my four we are actually passing a copy yeah of p2 so p p2 remains the original p2 remains valid so in ownership terms this means that when the ownership of p2 remains with the main function if you remove the copy trace derivation from the point type you will get a compile time error when trying to compile the code, hope it's understandable. So let's move on. So this structure as well, we are, we are saying that we use the drop trait. Yeah. So by now let's look at the clone method. So the clone it's it's more more like a deep copy. Yeah. It's more like trying to make a deep copy of data of an array. So we use the we use the we use the clone method, yeah. So it's expensive because it consumes a lot of memory. It uses a lot of memory. So it's more like a deep copy. So you are trying to copy an entire array, yeah, by using by using the clone method, yeah. So. Let's try to have a look on how we can use that. So just imagine I have an array right here. And let me give my array the name array one. And of course, it's an array data type serving unsigned 
128-bit integer. Yeah. As I said, it's an empty array. So that's how we declare an empty array. Yeah. So now let's have another array too, which has a, using the clone method, you are going to have a deep copy of array 1. That means array 2 in this case will as well be empty. Yeah. So we have, so this is how we clone the array 1. Now let's, 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 see, let's append, let's append elements to array 2, because initially it was empty. So let's use append. So we are appending So let's append 10. So you'll find out that we don't get any error because first we have cloned array 1 to get array 2. Yeah? So, but uh -huh. this is a great, great... So as I said, in case you, you get any red highlighted, it means you, you are not right, you are, you are, there is an error you haven't, you haven't corrected. So, here we attempt to clone, we have cloned first of all array 2 from array 1. But then we are attempting to append to array 2, but we have declared array 2 as mutable. Yeah? Yeah? So, we're going to, know, we have to declare it as a mutable, yeah? So that we can append to it. Yeah, so let's see what arises. So by us adding the mut mutable keyword, you can see that the, the, the red highlight disappears. That means our code is running correctly. So if you have to run this, you'll find that you get no error. Yeah. So we don't we don't need to use the array traits since we have created our own array. So let's attempt to run this. You'll find that we don't get any any errors. <coughs> so you'll find that we don't get any errors. As I said, you, you run by saying scav Cairo run. Yeah. So we just have some warnings. Yeah, so it has run without any error. That means our program, everything is in order. Just our program is not returning anything meaningful to us. So let's proceed. So let's proceed with our documentation. You can read more about moving value, values and ownership by following our documentation. And as, as in the previous sessions, we're using the the Cairo programming language book, which is at book.cairolang.org. So let's head on to something interesting, another concept in Cairo, and that's references and snapshots. Yeah. So the issue with tuple codes, as we looked at tuples in our previous session. Yeah. The issue with tuples that you have to return the array. Yeah, so one, one thing with tuples is that tuples are, tuples first of all have one data type. So you have, you, you only, no, it's arrays. Arrays have, you only have one, one data type, sorry. And arrays, you only have one data type. But in tuples, you can have multiple data types. Yeah. So. Let's look at what is called snapshots. Yeah. So Cairo, Cairo's ownership system prevents us from using a variable after we have moved it, protecting us from potentially writing twice the same memory cell. 
However, that's not so convenient. So we are going to use a concept which aids us to take a snap, yeah, a snap, you can understand it as a picture of the array. And then as we have looked at methods like clone method, we have seen that the clone method is it it consumes a lot of a lot of resources of the CPU. So we are going to we are going to we are going to use a snapshot. So in that snapshot, it doesn't consume. It's not like the clone method where you are consuming a lot of a lot of memory, a lot of a lot of. It's, it's expensive because you are copying entirely everything into the memory. But a snapshot, just like a snap, yeah, you it's intending its essence is that you are not copying everything entirely. You're not copying the memory model directly. So snapshots. They prevent us from using a variable after we move it. So in case a snapshot is an immutable view of a value at a certain point in time. And then I want us to recall that the whole entire principle of Cairo is that the memory is immutable. So modifying a value actually creates a new memory cell. So the old memory cell still exists, and snapshots are variables that refer to that old value. Yeah. So we can understand a snapshot as a view into the past. Yeah. So let's 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 look at snapshot in details. So we are going to have a function here. Let's have a practical bit of it. So we are going to have a function here. Let's 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 call this snapshot let me call my file snapshots.cairo so let's create our main function as well and then let's declare a mutable array and let's call it array one uh, which takes which is an array data type and it's taking in unsigned 1.8 bit integers so you have to declare that data type. So we have array. And then initially it's empty. Yeah. So then we can have you can you can have another variable. Yeah. Which takes a snapshot of array one. And let's let's just call it. I'm following the documentation. So we can call it my snapshot. You can just give it any name, any preferable name. So for me, mine, I've decided to call it my snapshot. Yeah. And it's taking a snap of array one. Yeah. It's not like a deep copy. It's not using, it's not like a, a clone method where it's copying everything entirely. This one is just taking a snap of the array. Yeah. So, and then Let's append to array one by adding maybe uh, adding an element five. Yeah. So remember first we declared it as a mutable array. Array one is mutable. So when it's mutable, you can add elements to it. Yeah. So I've added elements to array one. And remember, my snapshot is taking a snapshot of array one. Yeah. So let me declare another. Now let me have a function called calculate length. It just returns. It just returns the length of an array, yeah. And it only it takes in an array, but as well. So the beauty with the snapshot is that you can by you taking a snapshot of, for example, in this case, an array, you can have access to elements in the array and then you can you can you can manipulate it in using in things like returning the length of the elements yeah but you cannot change elements in that array because it's just a snapshot yeah remember you are not the actual owner of this array you just have a snapshot just it's just like you are having a view from the past 
So you don't have actual ownership of this array. So all you can do is manipulating which what is being exposed to you, but you cannot modify the original array itself. So let's have a calculate length function here. Yeah, and it's taking in an array and an argument. Yeah, and here we are giving it a snapshot. Yeah, but the snapshot, remember, because it's a snapshot, so it's the same data type as as the original array. So in this case, uh, my array one, since it's data type, it's a one point, it has one point unsigned, one point bits integers. So the snapshot as well has to, when we are passing in the snapshot as an argument, it as well has to have the same data type as the original. So in this case, it as well an unsigned 128-bit integer data type. Yeah, and since it's returning the size of the array, which is the length of the array. So in this case, yeah, it's, it's, it's returning a size. Yeah, it's returning a size. Yeah, so length is a size. Length is not an actual element in the array. So it's returning a size. So that's why you are giving it, but length cannot be negative. So that's why you are saying it's returning an unsigned. That's why using the u size data type. So and then it's returning. So how we get the array? We use the length function. We use the length function. Yeah. And in this case, we say array dot length. That's the method we use. Yeah. So now in this case, we we have our, our snapshot. Yeah. And initially, our snapshot, my snapshot is empty because it's having a snapshot to array one, which initially was as well empty. But then now we, we can see that. We have we have appended we have appended five to the original array, which is in this case array one. Yeah. So but in this case we want to find out the 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 length of of my snapshot, which is a snapshot to array one. Yeah. So that's why so let's try to obtain the length. And then here we call we we are getting the length from the calculate length function. Yeah. And it's taking in a snapshot. So in this case, it's my snapshot. Yeah. And that, that, sh that should be able to get us the length. Yeah. So we can print ln to obtain the length. Yeah. Let's say uh, the length of a snapshot is <coughs> so in this case we can set first length yeah so that's what we're doing so so we can anticipate our answer already because first we have said that my snapshot is a snapshot array one. Yeah. And array one in this case, array one in this case was empty. Yeah. So let's see the, the, the answer we get. So let's try to run our code and run our code by saying scab Cairo run govern as i said the lib.kyro function is a driver of the project so we have to first attach we have we have to declare the the module which is a file so in this case it's snapshots so we can say mod snapshots by say by declaring that mod snapshots that means that we are we are we are instructing the libdo kyro file which is the driver file to look up the snapshots module and run the snapshots module so when we let's attempt to run it one more time 
So let's attempt. Let's attempt to run it. So it's compiling. Yeah, as we are clearly anticipated. So since we are the snapshot was to our snapshot was taken basing on array one and initially array one was empty and by the time the snapshot was taken the array was empty so even after adding appending values elements to array one it does not affect the snapshot because the snapshot was taken when array one was initially empty so when we when you attempt to get the length of, array, of my snapshot it will be empty because the snapshot was taken at the point when array one was empty that's what a snapshot is in practical in practice so let's so you can use a snap operator to remember a snapshot just gives you a reference to 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 maybe to to extract maybe to an array but in case you want to go ahead and get the actual elements yeah in the snapshots you have to just like in just like in rust it's the same concept we we implement here you have to to decoerce the 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 reference that's in rust yeah so the same thing here is the snap operator using the asterisk key symbol is used to get back the elements in that snapshot so let's see the this snap operator in practice yeah so we, we can understand it as as follows yeah so just imagine you have you are seated in a restaurant yeah and members are seated in in rows yeah and so we can get that as let's use the number line system whereby we have one two three four so we have a member at seat one row one seat one two row one seat two row one seat three yeah so in case we need to get the person at seat one on row one by using the coordinate system yeah it will be it will be zero one because that's row one in case we have to follow the number line system so the person at coordinate zero one when we, we get when we pick that 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 coordinate the person that sits at row one the first row yeah and at the first row in the first seat we use the coordinates to pick to pick that person so that's the same thing we can understand by the disnap operator yeah so we use the disnap to get the actual elements to get the actual elements in in maybe in our structure maybe in this case it's an array yeah so that's how we can use the disnap operator so let's have a practical session about it So let's let's declare a rectangle. Yeah. So we are going to declare a rectangle. So let's create a new file and call this file this now operator. We can call it this now dot Cairo. Yeah. We can call it this nab dot Cairo, and let's declare a rectangle. Yeah, and then let's attach trace to it to indicate that this rectangle can can be like to indicate that we have to drop it like in case it's out of scope it can be dropped 
yeah so we add that that functionality by using the drop trait yeah and then our struct rectangle of course a rectangle must have a height and we are at we are giving the height a the height cannot be negative it can be negative yeah but that's not what we want yeah so we 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 are giving it an unsigned 64 bit integer yeah and then as well a with it yeah so let's as well give it a u64 data type yeah and then let's create our main function right here yeah and now let's instantiate the rectangle by having by having an instance called rec1 yeah and this rec1 let's give it a value of height uh, let's give it height um, let's give it height 10 yeah and then let's give it a width which is greater than the height and let's give it 15 yeah we have now we have now created an instance of the rectangle and now we have to write a function to return its area so how do we get an area of the rectangle it's by multiplying the width in this case and then by the height yeah but as i said a snapshot if at all we don't use the this snap operator as then we cannot get the actual values of the snapshot yeah so in this case maybe let's have our snapshot to rec one yeah and let's call this snapshot rec snapshot and let's so it's a snapshot to rec one yeah It's a snapshot to rec one. Yeah. And let's have our function here calculate the area. As I've said here, it's taking in a rectangle. But in this case, we can as well, so since it's natural to rectangle, it's just like a clone. Yeah, so because the only difference between a clone and a snapshot is that a snapshot is not consuming a lot of the memory because it's not a deep copying. Yeah, it's 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 something which has just referenced the the it's like a view of the original in this case of the original rectangle. Yeah, but in order to access the actual elements in this snapshot, we have to use the this snap operator so it's taking in a snapshot as an argument yeah so and then it's returning because area is so in this case our area is um a u64 because our, our height and the width all have a data type which is a u64 which is unsigned unsigned integer 64 so even as well after multiplying our height by the width we have to return a u64 so we cannot have a u128 because what we are multiplying had one database so then this is how we use the this snap operator So we say rec load height times please I want us to mark how I'm using my asterisk and then rec dot with it. Yeah. My first asterisk here is helping me to disnap the rec the height of the snap in this case. It has it's as snap to the rectangle struct. Yeah. 
and then my second asterisk is to multiply because to get the area is the height and the width and then my third asterisk which is before the rec dot width is to is to help me this snap the width from the rectangle snap yeah so now um, that's my that's my that's my function to get the to calculate the area yeah so now i can say let area equals calculate area yeah and this case is taking in a snapshot so in this case my snapshot i've already said it's rec snapshot yeah and then let, let me print the area that's what i intend to get yeah so area here you can write area here and get area so our program should run properly without any errors yeah but i want us to notice how i've used the drop traits yeah i've attached the drop traits to because after after this the main scope has ended the rectangle has to be dropped and you have to implement that by calling the the trait which is the drop trait so in this case we don't need to use the copy trait yeah because we are not copying anything we are we are using snapshots yeah so and then call let's call the this snap module i said we declare a module just like in Python, how you say import a module, for example, an OS module. Even here in our lib.kyro file, which is the driver of the project, we have to call the, the module we intend to run. And in this case, it's this snap.kyro. So we have to, to call it by using the mod keyword. Yeah. The mod keyword. And then after, then we call the name of the module which in this case is the name of the file yeah you don't attend the extension because Cairo can automatically detect that it's a Cairo file yeah so now after doing that let's run our project so we run our project by saying scab Cairo run that's how we run our project and it should run without returning us any errors so it's compiling in a few seconds it return to give us the answer which is the error yeah so so in this case our area is 150 so let's let's confirm that this is this area so in this case we have 10 times 15 which which is 150 meaning that our our answer is correct our program is giving us the anticipated results we want yeah so that's snapshots for us in in practice yeah so then let's look at another thing new table references yeah so in case you want to modify yeah something something in the reference you have to declare it as a mutable reference you have to declare a mutable reference so what that means is that mutable references are actually mutable values past the function past the function that has implicit return at the end of the function returning ownership to the calling context by doing so they allow us to mutate the value past while keeping ownership of it by returning it automatically at the end of the execution yeah so in Cairo you can pass a parameter yeah as a mutable reference using the ref keyword, the ref modifier. Yeah? So there's a note here. 
In Kairi, a, par a parameter can only be passed as a mutable reference using the ref modifier if the variable is declared as mutable with the mute keyword. So let's see how we can work with this. Let's have a practical session about it. So let's let me create a new file here. Yeah, and call it mutable reference dot Cairo. Yeah. And then let me call my traits. In this case, it's the derived traits. In this case, it's the block trait because I'm not copying anything. I'm using references. So I'm declaring my that my 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 rectangle can be dropped. That's why I need to call the dog trait. Yeah. But then my rectangle has a height, which is the U64. And then it as well has a width, which is as well a U64. Yeah. So we are going to see something interesting right here. So we have, let's declare a mutable rectangle and it's a mute, it's, it's an instance. We are declaring it as an immutable instance. Yeah. So it's taking in a height of, of let's call it six. Yeah. And it's thinking as well with it. We are constructing the height of three or six. I had a width of 10. Yeah. So we are we 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 are we want to create a function which is called a flip function. Yeah. Since we are flipping the the height and the width, we have to first we must have we must have first declared the rectangle as mutable because we are flipping. Flipping means you are changing things. You are changing the order. Yeah. So in this case, we are flipping the elements in the struct, which is the rectangle. Yeah. So now that's what our function intends to do. So it's a flip function. Yeah. So it's taking a reference to the rectangle which is a rectangle struct, yeah? And then after doing that, yeah? So in case you understand how, if I don't have in C code, in case I want to copy A to B, yeah? I have to first create an, another temporary variable called C. That's the same thing which is happening here. Yeah. I'm declaring a new temporary variable, which is temp, and I've declared it as equal to the height. So this is in case I intend to flip the to flip the width and the height, I have to first declare another variable which is empty. Yeah, and then I'm, I have to first move A to the empty variable. Yeah, and that's how I can interchange them. So then, this is supposed to be rec dot height. You can put rec dot width. That's how I can flip, flip, flip the two variables. That will first create another empty variable, which is to handle, to help aid me in flipping. It's just similar to how, how you copy elements, maybe how you copy variables in the C programming language, similar to this. It's not your
Yeah. So then let me call my flip function. It's taking in a reference to the original rectangle. And then after that, I intend to print the height and the width. In this case, it's rectangle dot height because I, after because I've flipped them, so in the, the height in this case is going to be ten, and the width in this case is going to be three. That's my code. I have to call it by the like say here mutable. All right. So. You have to declare it in, in the lib.cairo and after doing that I can successfully run by saying scum by saying scum cairo run so supposed to return me the height and then the wedding Remember, I flipped. Yeah, so that's what we intended. So I said, in this case, the height is six. And with it, just initially before we flip. So after flipping, the height becomes ten, and the width becomes six. So. The height becomes 10 and then it becomes 6. So that's how we can use mutable references. So let's go to another interesting concept in the Cairo programming language. And this helps us to structure our data. So that's something called using structs. Yeah. So let's see how to use let's see structs in detail so a struct or structure is a custom data type that lets you package together and name multiple related values that make up a meaningful group if you are familiar with an object reading oriented programming language like python for example a struct is like an object is data attributes but structs are not there in python but um in languages like C, C has structs, yeah, and then as well Rust as well has structs, yeah. So, the the a similar case scenario to structs in Python is called classes. So if you are familiar with an object oriented programming language, for example Python, the struct is like an object that are attributes so and a class in python is an object so in this case example we'll compare and contracts tuples with structs to build on what you already know and demonstrate when structs are better way to group data yeah so we are like what we are going to demonstrate is how do you find an instantiate struct then structs can as well have functions they can as well have associated functions which are called methods yeah, and then they can as well have functions which are not directly a method. So a method is like it's 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 a function to modify the object itself. Yeah. So structs and enums are the building blocks for creating new types in your programming domain. So we use them actually a lot to to group our structured that our related data 
So we group it in structs, tuples, arrays. So let's proceed. So structs are similar to tuples in that both hold multiple rated values like tuples. So structs can have different, can have values which have different data types. So the pieces of struct can be of different data types, unlike with tuples. In a struct, unlike in tuples, in a struct you will name each piece of data. So it's clear that the values mean. So in tuples, as we saw in the previous sessions, you don't need to clearly define the data type, but in structs you have to. Yeah. So adding these names means that structs are more flexible than tuples. You don't have to rely on the order of the data to specify or access the values of an instance. Yeah. So let's see structs in practice. How we can work with structs? How, how do we declare a struct? And how do we attach? How do we add elements to this struct? So let's create a new file here. And let's call it structs.chiron. And then as well, we are we are defining our structure, here, but remember as well, it can get out of, of scope. That means it can be dropped. So that means it has we have to attach a drop trait to it. And we do that by saying yeah, struct user. So our struct in this case is a user. So user can be active. And, and in this case, active is a bool. We can act, either can be active or, or user can be inactive. So it's true or false, is user active or is user not active? So a user can have a username. In this case, it's a byte array. A byte array meaning that you can have more than 31 characters. Yeah. And then a user can have an email, which as well can be a byte array. So then we want as well trace the number of times the user has signed in, which is a sign in count. In this case, it's a use text for. So that's how that's our simple struct. Yeah. That's our simple struct in this case. Yeah. So then we can Let's see how we can use this struct we've created in practice. So let's create our, our main function. And let's declare an instance, which is user2, which is a mutable instance, because it's, it's by declaring it as a mutable instance, it means that some things in this instance which we have created <clears throat> some things can be changed we can add and then we can as well remove we can add elements in this instance that's why we are declaring it as a minimal instance so it's an instance to the user struct and then we are, we are constructing it with active as true with the username as can give it a username. Let me give it Jose at me dot com. And then as well, we can give it okay. The username, let me give it Jose one, two, three. Let me construct it with an email. So in this case, let it be Jose at email. Can as well be at me dot com. And then let me say sign in count. You can give it a sign in count. In this case, it can be one. Sign in count. 
or you can give it a name. In this case, I'll say medic king. So, and, but then I can decide to change. That's the reason that's why I declare it as a mutable instance. So, in case I say, in case I want to change the email, maybe um, I signed up with another email, but then I have changed an email. So I can say user two dot email user two dot email and in this case let me create a new email let me attach a new email and let it be Jose twenty twenty fourteen at me dot com yeah so if I come and print the new email you will see that the initial email has changed my new email so in this case it's user two dot email user to email as I said you have to call that module in the lib.cairo in this case struct so we hope to our pro program is supposed to return the new email which is joseph 14 at mail.com because we have changed it So let's run our program. We run it by saying scab error run. So we are returning an error. We are getting an error. Why is it an error? Format string argument must be a string literal. Okay. From a string argument must be a string literal. So we are having an error right here. So let's try to solve the error. Okay. So let's first print the struct the instance itself. Yeah. Let's first print the instance itself. Still, we are having the same error. We are getting the same error. Okay, I think I'm realizing what the error, where, where are we getting the error from? So 
So if uh, initially if I to run this, let's first see whether we return any error. So, if you are wrong, you say that we don't get any error. And this is how we change. So, to, uh, to access any, any element in the structure, yeah? So, in this case, it's an email. You say, for example, we have created a new, we have constructed a new, a new instance, which is the user tool. And then to access the email, you use the dot, dot notation. Say, user tool dot email. Yeah, that's if I need to access. Then if I need to change, that's why I'm saying user to dot email is equal to the new email. Yeah. And then there's an interesting concept right here. So in case I want to have another instance to to I have another instance, but which is about like 90% having similar elements, similar field elements to field elements, in this case, the attributes to user 2. So let me call it, let user 3. Yeah. Let us use that screen. And it's having the same data type. It's an instance of the user struct. Yeah. And it's only has the only different thing is the image. I don't need to rewrite everything as compared to our previous case scenario. I can just benchmark user too. So if it has only the email as the different attribute, then in this case, let me give it an email as me at example.com. Yeah. And then it has the other remain similar as in user two. Yeah. So we use those double dots and then user two. So what this means is that you're only changing yeah you're only changing the email right but the others you are just copying the other attributes of user two so by using double nodes so that's an interesting concept in structs So let's go ahead, let's proceed. So in case you want to tinker more with structs, you can check out the documentation. Everything is straightforward. But let's see how we can have methods on these trucks yeah so methods are we can understand them as functions which modify the struct itself the object itself and then functions methods are functions which modify the struct itself but then that means they have to take the self keyword because they're modifying the struct itself but then functions are just associated functions they don't modify the cell the object itself that's why they don't need to take in the self keyword yeah so let's look at methods
let's go back to our let's create a new function let's create a new file and call it methods dot carrier yeah and then it's taking in the it's because we have this rectangle the struct has to be dropped when it's out of stock of or scope it has to be dropped that's why you need to to attach the the drop rate and then as well it can be copied so because we are going to use snapshots so that means we have to import the copy trade. So we have to, yeah, we have to import the copy trade. And then attach it directly to the struct which is a rectangle. So we're having a struct which is a rectangle. At this point we can all construct the struct. And it has a width, which is the U64 data type. And it has as well has the height, which is the U64. So we are going to cover traits in details, but let's first implement it here. So traits in other languages like TypeScript is similar to the interface. Yeah. So we first declare we first declare our methods, and methods have to take in the self keyword. So self meaning that it's it's a method which is manipulating something in the object itself and it's taking in a parameter as a snapshot to a rectangle right here and it's returning a u64 because it's returning the area it has to be a u64 So after declaring it in a trait, we have to use the implement implement keyword. Yeah. Oh. To define it, to define it under the struct, which in this case is the rectangle. So fn area. So it's a method taking in a rectangle snapshot. Returning a U64. So as very well known, we use the disnap operator. to get the width diamonds the height after doing that then we are going to call the area method in the main function. So we create a new instance of the rectangle. In this case, it's rect1. And it's taking in a width of 30. Then it's as well taking us taking a height of 50. Yeah. And then how do we call the method of the struct?
So since it's it's a method, so and if you had to notice something that in when you're writing a method, you have to the first argument is self the self keyword. Yeah. Self meaning that it's it's something which is the function is the associated function to the object itself. So it's manipulating the object itself. So that's why you have to attach it to a self keyword. Self meaning is the actual object itself. So then in this case we say rectangle one, which was that instance. Yeah. Our instance to the rectangle object. And then it's rectangle one look area. So we are printing the area. Let's go to our lib.cairo and call this module. The name of the module is methods. So let's run our program. So it's running, it's compiling. So our error is 1,500, 1, as we anticipated, because we have 50, 10, 30. So that's a method. That's how methods, so methods, uh, they modify the object itself, whereas functions don't modify the actual object. So in function, you don't need to have a self keyword in the argument, yeah, in the in the parameter. So let's proceed and with our documentation. So you can you can check out the documentation and acquaint yourself with one knowledge on on how to use method in the Cairo programming language, but meanwhile. Let me implement a function as well. So I can add a comment right here. I can add a comment right here. And then let me say function and graph it. As I said, functions don't directly talk to. They don't that's why you don't get taken the soft keyword. So I can write a function to create a new rectangle, a new rectangle. Every time I want to construct a rectangle, let me just call it so let me call it function new. I can call it new rectangle. And then it's taking in the way it is. Maybe we use 64. And then it's as well taking in the height, which is the U64, and it's returning the newly formed rectangle. So, rectangle, and then we need the rectangle has the width. It's returning a rectangle right here. So 
then I can go ahead I can go ahead and and print the new reformed rectangle okay. rectangle key and because I already have the new function we can just call it remember it's a function of the rectangle struct so I call it like this rectangle traits and then new So I'm um, adding something new right here, the generate trait. Now the generate trait, what it, it saves me from having to define a trait every time I need to create methods and functions of this trait, of, of the rectangle trait. Yeah? So every time I have it there, we are going to use it a lot of in, in StackNet. And every time I, I, I attach it to the implement to to the implement block i don't need to define i don't need to define the traits initially i don't i don't need to declare the, the methods in the trait so it helps me to handle all that Now I'm creating a new rectangle 15, what is 15, and height 80. Then I want to print it out. So the function is near it. And every time I intend to print out an object, I have to use this. Similar to how you do it in Rust, do you notice this? I have to have my curly brackets, then in two, then I have the double colon and the quotation mark. And then here, I'm having a snapshot to. Rect to so I have to import the debug traits as well. Because I intend to to print to print the object itself. So how do I import the debug print? We can search it up. Search it right here.
We are going to look at trades in full details. So, try to import it here. Views or <coughs> so I've been putting it. Let's attempt to run our program and see what we get. So it's compiling, compiling our code. Yeah, so it returns us, returns successfully without any error. So if we were to see, there's, it returns the new re the rectangle is rectangle with the width 50 and height 80. And as you can see, that's what we intended. So we intended to create a new rectangle with a width of 80 and height of 50. Yeah. So the debug trait was really, really so important for us to re really return the, the newly formed object. So that's how you you return the newly formed object. So that's so we have looked at handling methods, and then we have also looked at functions. So we are going to use a lot of functions and methods in our stack and smart contracts, and structs are really fundamental in structuring our data that. When we're building our stackness smart contract. So let's go ahead and look at something interesting here, and that's enum. So enums. So in this chapter, we're going to look at enums, still um benchmarking the Cairo documentation. So enums are it's a short for enumeration. They allow us to define a type by enumerating its possible variants. So let's proceed. So enums, that's how you declare an enum. That's how you construct an enum. And as well, you have to add the drop trait because when it's out of stock or, or scope when it's out of scope it has to be dropped so that's why we have to to attach that drop trait to it so let's have practical session about it right here Let's create a new file and let's call it enum.cairo. You can add a comment. I said we, we add a comment by using the forward slashes, double forward slashes. So enum. Then we let's attach our block traits. Thank you. 
and right here I'm following the documentation so we are right here we have directions we have another direct the north direction kind of similar the orientation of the, of the structure of the inner structure is kind of similar to the structure and then right here we have our uh, east and right we have our uh, south and then we have our uh, west so i've declared i've constructed an enum yeah so in case i want to add associate very very values to the to the field elements of the enum i have to attach a data type so in this case minus can have an associate value the data type which is a u128 similar thing to is as well let me construct it with let me add a, a u128 as well then as well as south U128 then the west so then we are going to so as well enums can have custom data types for each variant so for example We can have a third 252. I can as well have another enum and call it message. Yeah. And it has echo as well, right here. Yeah. This echo is a third two five two a default data type as a moon. This right here is a U one twenty eight and a U one twenty eight. So as well I have to attach the drop traits onto it because it can go out of scope. So it's similar to similar to to structs enums can as well have enums can as well have methods and we implemented methods a similar way how we did it in the structs so Let's implement structs right here. Yeah. So as well, we have to declare the methods in the traits. And then we are having a method to process. So enums and structs are kind of similar. So after declaring you have to then define the implement block of the traits. Then we define our method right here. It's part of the one. So then
right here. So this is how we are accessing each individual variant in the in the inner. So you have to add the double columns, the message which is the inner, and then in case you want to access each individual variant in the inner, so you have to use the double columns. In this case, we want to have the quit variant. And we are going to have we are going to have a look at the match. How will we are going to have we are going to think at the match in depth when you are looking at the option when you are looking at trades like options. One option is a trade, and in our previous session we looked at an option can return us it has two cases where it returns that the positive and then it returns scenario where you you it doesn't return what you what you intended to for example if i if i told i intend to return x as five so i can use an option trade to return to handle two case scenarios in case where i don't have x i wanted to return that x is not a value so can return x the value and then I it can return a statement x is not a value. So this is how I access an individual variant in the enum. So I'm still as well following the documentation. So option enum and disadvantages. So the option enum is a standard Cairo enum that represents the concept of an option of value. It has two variants, sum and none. Sum indicates that there is a value of type T, while none represents the absence of a value. So the option enum allows you to exclude represent the possibility of a value being absent making your code more expressive and easier to reason about so using an option in them can also help prevent bugs so you can check that out and discover it what goes along with the option in them in details following our documentation so in our in our smart contracts we are going to use the option in them a lot yeah and you as well come across things like panics yeah a panic panic is Cautiously, cautiously used because every time you, you you want you maybe use the panic in a case scenario whereby you don't want to return an error your your the execution will stop right there it will panic maybe it will panic but when you're using the option in them we give it an allowance that in case maybe we need to return a value in case the value is not available it returns it returns a statement maybe value is not available so we are going to stop here for today and thank you so much for everyone for joining and this is we are still tinkering the Cairo programming language and that's part of a session of our stack names Kampala Beska and after after we have after we have tinkered the, the whole program the Cairo programming language we are going to go into writing us stack smart contracts so as i said 
we are going to be writing our logics using Cairo. So that's why we really need to acquaint ourselves with the Cairo programming language. And I I just I, I just to to always refer to the documentation, the official documentation book.cairolang.com. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's keep let's keep it straight.